Okay, so let us see what I have here. Okay, so um, I think for most of you, uh, let's just talk about recursion uh, with a question over here. Okay. Um, so we'll do part three first, uh, part three B in particular, because that one is the easiest out of all. Um, let's read the question for those of you who haven't. So the question is like, given a positive number uh, and the fact, the value of factorial n written as n uh, exclamation mark is n times n minus 1 exclamation mark. Additionally, the value of 0 factorial is 1. Write a recursive and iterative function of factorial n that computes the value of n. Now, um, let's try to do this iteratively, right? If we do it iteratively, um, just like the burger question last year, uh, last week, we will have like some sort of variable to keep track of the value of the factorial as it evolves. So for example, we'll start with like, uh, say we have, um, okay. So we'll start usually with a variable answer, say answer. Mm. Answer, we'll initiate with uh, value. Now, we'll initiate it with the value 1. The reason is because, um, I mean like, uh, because it's factorial. In this case, if you initiate the value with 0, right, if you time whatever number multiplied by 0 is 0, as you guys know, then you do the iteration for i in range 1 to, say, uh, n plus 1. You would, you would multiply your answer with uh, i. And then simply return the answer. In this case, right, it means you can create an iteration of uh, the factorial. So and, uh, every time the value of i changes, like i is equals to uh, 1, ans is like 1 times 1, i is 2 is ans, answer is 1 times 1 times 2, 1 times 1 times 2 times 3, and so on. Now this is the iterative way. Uh, now, how do we come up with the recursion? I think we should um, remember what recursion is. So if you guys remember, recursion is basically a function that calls itself back. Itself back. So say I have a function. Uh, what's the function name? Sum n. So in somewhere in the function, right, it should actually call itself back. Right. Now, if you actually try to trade, uh, do this, right, actually, you can actually spot some problems already. Let me erase this part. First. The first problem is that it will keep on calling ends, uh, sum. So when I call sum n, it will give me another sum n. And sum n will give me another sum n. And it will keep on happening. There are two problems here. First, it's an infinite loop. Secondly, uh, nothing is changing. Lah. Ideally, what we want to do is that we want to have the n value keep on changing, keep on changing, and at a particular condition, at a, once it changed to a particular state, um, it basically stops uh, stops calling itself. So we need another return statement that stops calling itself. Return something. Right. So in this case, if you can see in this case, right, um, uh, the when you do iteration, right, you will keep on iterating. The value of i, or perhaps in this case n or whatever, will keep on changing in, in increasing to n n plus n. Yes, to n. But then that's a problem. 
like uh, when it comes to um, iteration, right? You can always usually like stop at n, like from small to big. But then uh, for iteration for recursion, right? What you want to do is that actually like you want the value to actually keep on changing to a point where uh, to a very to a point where everyone have it lah. Um, in other words, you want a point that regardless of regardless of the value of n right you insert, you, all the n's that you insert will actually achieve one point. Now that if you pick the end point, if you in this case right the start point is one, and end point is uh, n. The thing is because the end point is n right, if for recursion it cannot work because it means that the value of n keeps on changing and changing and it's not stable. But what do we know is that for every value of n, it will if start at one. So intuitively, when we do recursion, what we want to do is actually reverse it. Instead of starting at one, we want to start at n, and n at one. So we want to reverse it in a way. So in this case, we want to do a stop. Uh, we want to do a conditional here. If n is equals to one, Right, one or zero, one, simply return something that does not call itself back. Else, it will simply call itself back. Now, I think we already create a stopping condition, which, is, which FYI is this one, this part over here, right? This part over here is called a base case. Now the problem is like, um, if you actually keep tracing this right, it actually still stay the same. It will keep on calling some n, some n, some n, some n again. So how do we ensure that um, the value of some? Uh, how do we ensure that we actually achieve the condition in the base case? Means that the value inside the call function should change. So the rule of thumb, another rule of thumb is basically the value inside the function call inside here will definitely change. And usually it's a smaller number. Since remember, we want to start at n and n's at one, right? What we want to do is to decrease it one by one. So perhaps for this case, what we want to do is do an n minus one. Perfect. Now let's try to run the code. If we run the code, some n will give me some n minus one, some n minus one will give me some n minus two, some n minus two will give me some n minus three until until a particular point where it's some two, it will some one, and then basically after some one, it will give me whatever is here. But the problem is that if we only like re say we return the value in this box, right? It means that we don't really do the 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 factorial question, where we need to do the multiplication. Hence, we need we cannot just like um, we cannot just like call the function back. We need to do some sort of uh, calculation at, as well. And in this case, I think this is a recursive formula, where it's quite straightforward. So basically in a straightforward recursive formula, you know that um, this one is factorial n is equals to n times factorial n minus one. So we know that we need to multiply it with uh, the factorial of n minus one. So we'll just simply return n times sum of n minus one. Hey, sorry, this one is not sum. Shit, I've been talking the wrong thing all this time. Lastly, uh, when we do a return statement, when n is one, we basically need to know what is the value of factorial one. Or maybe the value of factorial zero. In that case, if the value of factorial zero, then uh, then you want the base case to be zero. And then we know that the value of factorial zero is one, so we'll return one. So generally, when you want to come up with a recursive formula. A recursive formula, 
the first things you need to do is like uh, you need to have a base case. You need to have a base case to actually stop the recurs recursion from calling itself over and over again. And in the base case, right, the return statement should not call itself back. Second, it should have a return statement that actually calls itself back. However, the value inside of this n should, the value inside the parameter should change. Third, usually there will be a calculation involved. And lastly, I think like to figure out the base case, usually just like think of it this way. Lah. Like if I have the input A, B, and C, right? Each of these values will keep on changing, right? As it costs. But at a certain point, everything should converge to a particular point, say the value Z. Now the value Z is the base case that you kind of want. Lah. Because eventually for all value, all inputs of A, B, and Z, right, everything will converge to Z. That's the case that you want. Lah. Um, I know it's not like the clearest explanation, but then, uh, yeah, lah, recursion requires a lot of practice. So, so far, uh, is it clear but I'm is it quite clear how to do for like factorial uh, maybe some thumbs up if not just ask questions in the chat if there are any questions just ask in the chat why don't you do n equals to one um, it's okay actually like why don't I do? I mean, like, it's just preference. I mean, you know, in this case, I pick zero because I just want to follow the question, like, where uh, the base case for zero is, uh, the base case for a factorial is actually zero factorial. But yeah, like, I, I understand that zero factorial is actually equals to one factorial, which is equals to one. How do you recur strings? Uh, actually, that's the third question that we're going to attempt. Yeah, we'll go that after that. Why does recursive function take up more space? Where will the video? Oh, the video will be uploaded in. It's actually, I already pinned it in the Telegram group description. Actually, so yeah, it's already in the Telegram group description. Why does recursive function take up more space? Um, because. When I do this, factorial n, uh, if n equals to zero, return one else, return n times factorial n minus one. So what happens here is that when I call, say, like factorial 10, right? Um, what's going to happen in the computer is that it will start expanding this last, say, return n times factorial 10, right? Then it will expand n times uh, 10, sorry. Um, it will start expanding like 10 times f9, 10 times 9 times f8, until like 10 times until 1. And then it will start summing it up. If you can see, right, the space all keeps on expanding. That's why factorial requires more space. In the case for iteration, right? In the case for iteration, right? For i in range n, then like ans is like i times a answer. If you can see, right, it does not um, expand. It will just like take one number, join it with answer, take one number, join it with answer. So like there's only like two, two blocks of numbers that you kind of need to keep track. While this one keeps on expanding, lah. Uh, I hope that explains. Uh, what is the maximum recursion limit error means? Now, because of this expanding nature of um, recursion, right? They do have limitations. Your computer cannot handle if it just like expands infinitely. So that's the that's what the meaning of error lah. So you cannot just like. So that's why like for recursion, right? There are limitations, and you cannot just expand whatever you like. For recursion, if it uses if, but for iteration, it uses they use while and for loop. Uh, I mean, um, I think uh, rather than approaching it in a, like uh, iteration, use while, while and for recursion, it uses if. I think the better way to approach it is like recursion is 
our style of coding. It's not exactly syntax. It is a way that you approach a problem and a way for you to actually tackle the challenge. And the principle of recur the key of recursion is it calls the function back. So in the case, right, sometimes you will need it, uh, some for or while loop inside a recursion to do some minor calculations. Some, but I, I don't think that's gonna be the case for 10.e. But yeah, I don't want you to like think, oh, recursion is if else, uh, iteration is for and while. Because even in iteration, right, sometimes you might need to use if else. Uh, the return result is it that for wait the return result for the base case goes to the recursion yeah how to find the largest number that your iterative or recursion function can handle generally speaking when we say iteration right basically uh, it can handle any number it, when we talk about iteration, right, it can handle any number because yeah, la, because of this, la, the space, right, it just takes in two space, like the container, the like the variable that you save and like the number that you want to put inside the container. So it basically can do it, la, just like give it time can. If recursion, right, how to find it out? Like, yeah, as mentioned before, there's a maximum recursion error. And the way to find it out is basically just to check manually, like, Oh, let's try like 1 million. Let's try 10 million. Let's try 100 million. That's the only way to check. Is it that for each recursion can convert into only one loop? For nested loops need more recur recursion function. Uh, mm, um, for nested loops, I'm, I don't have the answer for that, uh, whether nested loops need more recurs recursive functions. I don't have the answer to that. Um, how to say, uh, um, I think if you can come up with a question, that would be better. But yeah, I don't have the answer for that. Like the one in part four. The one in part four. Uh, Oh yeah, yeah. Basically, um, if you see for a, for a actually uses a function that you write in part three. Okay, I think we'll just try uh, another question, part three. So, if um, I think there's uh, for part B for what does nested loops mean? Nested loops is like uh, for i in range m, for i for j in range and this is a nested loop lah. means that there are a loop inside a loop okay um okay i think we'll try at number 3a i think 3a also kind of help for those of you who actually asked about the string recursion because it's quite similar so we have a sum problem. What we're trying to do is like, given the digits of five, two, six, three, four, we want to sum them up into 20. So um, I think for iteration, the general part is that um, we want to have an answer that keeps our answer, say zero, then basically create a for loop for every digit in the number i know this is not actual code but this is like the pseudo code and you guys can figure it out how to achieve this basically answer you add by a digit and return answer now how to do with recurs recursive right I think I'll use another color. Now for recurs recursion, right? Uh, remember our principle that we go from big to small. So in this case, our big is five, two, six, three, and four. Now we want to make it smaller, but 
how do we exactly make it smaller? Um, in this case, right, uh, we iterate from each number, right? Five, two, six, three, four. So I think uh, the way to make it small, one way to make it smaller is actually to chop off the digits. You can actually chop this part off, five plus two, six, three, four. And then chop off another digit again, five plus two plus six, three, four. And then chop off another digit again, three, four. And then finally chop off all the digit. Lah. So in the case where you actually need to use the characters or like the numbers in each part, right? The way is actually to do this. Lah. So in this case, right, uh, we will should define our best space case. If something else, uh, sorry, return uh, something else, return. So since we want to add up all the numbers, right, it means that we want to take off one, one digit. So like uh, take off like first digit. And then basically ca call the sum of the leftover digits. So if I if I say I have five, two, six, three, four, this is the first digit, and this is the leftover digits. Now, if we keep on taking on the sh numbers one by one, right? Like, you know, like you you take on the first digit and remove the take. If you take the first digit off and then like leave with the last digit, then I think. Two, six, three, four, six, three, four, three, four, four. So I guess um, whatever happens, right? The last case scenario is actually your number is a single digit. So then you wanna check if n is a single digit, then return n. Hence we already receive the answer for A. So in this case, right, you can see that um, you can try another number, like, say like one, two, three, four, five. We will take off the first number, three, four, five, three, four, five, four, five, five. You can see that in this case, right, earlier, like we tried to see what is the final point that all at all inputs will arrive? And apparently there's no one input. Lah. Everything is just like, it can be zero, it can be one, it can be two, it can be three, it can be four, it can be five, depending on the last digit of the number, right? But then we know for sure that it will actually end when the number is only one digit left. And when it's one digit left, we should not call itself back and simply just return the value. Lah. So that's how you do sum. Any questions? If I define another function inside a function and I call the function back inside the... So... Um, oh, oh, okay, okay. Um, so uh, I just want to clarify first. Uh, uh, so like def a, a def x, and then inside is def y, and then return uh, ans, then return uh, y ans. I'm not so sure how this is possible. Uh, Nick, I don't know how this is possible since like this variable doesn't exist yet. Um, and no, this is not recursive. Um, I, I would consider it recursive if, I would consider it recursive if um, you do a recursive function here, if something else. Then 
you return y something. I would consider this recursive. And there are some assignments that actually needs this. And this, this right, this part over here is usually called a helper function. Sometimes you cannot uh, do it straight away. So you kind of need to create another function to help you do the recursion. Can you, okay, uh, yeah. So only if the base function we are defining is called back. Yes, lah. I mean, if, I mean, like basically in recursion, yeah, lah, you call it back. At least you should see that it should keep on calling itself back over and over, lah, like a repetition. Okay, uh, uh, Joseph, uh, can you explain how the recursion goes? So in this case, right, uh, I have a number. Oops, I'll use it. I have a number five, two, six, three, four. Side sum. What I want to do is actually to break the numbers down, lah. So this one, right, is also equivalent to five plus sum. 2, 6, 3, 4, which is equals also to 5 plus 2 plus sum 6, 3, 4, 5 plus 2 plus 6 plus sum 3, 4. So that's how this recursion happens. Lah. Nice. Yeah, this is how the code works. Lah. Basically, what we're trying to do is actually we break down bits by bits. Lah. You take the first number, pull it out. You take the first number, pull it out. You take it another one, pull it out. You take it another one, pull it out. And so on and so on. So in this case, yeah, like recursion. For recursion, what you want to do is you, you start from the big part and take smaller. Now, how do you take the number and pull it out though? Now, that's a good, good question. Um... There are two ways. There are two ways. One is the, the, the good way and one is the hack way. The good way, the good way is, uh, the good way is that um, what you wanna, when we're dealing with numbers, right, and we wanna take the integers, what you wanna do is actually, you do a modulo 10, which in the case of five to six, three, four, this will give us four. Right, and then for the leftover digits, we will simply do an n floor 10, which will give us 5, 2, 6, 3. So in this case, right, in, uh, it's kind of the other way around. So like, we'll be like, uh, sum 5, 2, 6, 6, 3 plus 4, then like s 5, 2, 6 plus 3 plus 4, and so on. So that's how you actually iterate through the digits. Usually, you'll take the modulo 10, take the five last digit, and then you remove the last digit by actually doing a floor division. That's the first way. Okay, take note, this, this method is actually very important during exams. The second way is to iterate it the way we iterate through our burgers last week. Remember how we iterate through our burgers? For ingredient, in burger. Now, but if you remember, right? Um, but if you remember, for burger, right? Burger, um, it's a string. Well, our number is an integer. How do we solve it? Simply convert the number to a string, law. So, uh, string, n. After you convert it, then you can do string slicing law. Zero and then string and like one till the end. This one basically takes the first string, the first character of the string till the end. If I do this long way instead, what will I get? Which, what long way are? What, what do you mean by long way? Like use string. Uh, 
I mean, say, I mean, like, as long as this is, it is not explicitly mentioned in the assignment, then you can lah. I, oh, that one is confirmed penalty. That one is confirmed penal penalized. Nope, that, that one is confirmed penalized. Yep, that one is like, that one is lazy. <laughs> Okay, I think so, like, just to show you guys a bit uh, more, I think, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I think I wanna, I just wanna show this, lah. Okay, uh, can, can you explain the ampersand sentence? So, like, this is the official answer for the sum, when, um, basically, we have a base or initial value, and then basically the computation and then the continuation slash next value and then the stop or base case and then uh, for iteration you need a temporary result so in this case right um, say we have five two six three one again in the iteration result we'll see like what n is greater than zero yes it is greater than zero then rest is uh, rest is rest plus n percentile zero ten. Wait, I think this is four. And n percentile ten uh, n modulo ten is four. So zero plus four. The rest the rest value is currently four. And then it changed the value n is n ten, which is five two six three. And then it will loop again. It will check is n greater than zero. Yes, it's still greater than zero because it's still five two six three. So we'll do it again. Four plus five two six three modulo three modulo ten, which is three. Four plus three is seven. And the value of n is five two six now. Five two six. Rest is uh seven plus six. N is five two. Five two address is uh, thirteen plus two, and is five. Now rest is like uh, fifteen plus five, which is twenty, and is zero because five modulo ten is zero, right? And then in the final evaluation, zero is not greater than zero. Then the loop terminates, and then it will return rest equals to twenty. Uh, is that okay? Uh, is that okay? Joseph? Does that explain your query? I do hope it does. So when you are trying to iterate things through a uh, number, la, through numbers, this is the way. La. If you guys don't know, it's okay. Most people don't know. That's why you guys learn. La. So um, this is for the case for factorial. Uh, similar, like you can see the similarity. How uh, um, you have a base case, you have a base case, you have this, you have the computational part, and then like what's the next value? I mean, this one is a while loop, lah. I mean, I generally I don't as I think I've explained it before my distaste for while loops. So basically, if it's in the for loop, right? Uh, I mean, we know that um, the value of an changes in this range now already. Like this helps us change the value of n already. And the base case is usually here already. Scenario, the base condition, and yeah, this one is here. Okay. So I hope that's clear that clears things up um, so um, I know there are some complete um, yeah so there you have it um, you have uh, two different questions one is one is a question where it's very clear what is the recursive function formula as you can immediately come up with a recursive formula one is something that is not so straightforward 
basically you need to iterate through the digits one by one. And later on, later on, just remind me, later on we'll try one more example where you guys are not given anything. So you guys are just like given a uh, information and you guys are not given what is the recursive formula or not. But before that, I, what I want to do is I want to try to attempt this question over here, the part two. Uh, we already learned how to do digits, right? So I think we can also do this part also. Recursion, I'll make this smaller. Right, I bet you all can do this. So I think we did this question last week, but in iterative, so for a recap, we have a total price and then we do a lot of if, if statements that somewhere in between there will be like total plus uh, the actual price, uh, like say $10. And then once uh, it's done, return total. Oh yeah, I forgot that there's a for loop here as well. For ingredient in burger. Now, how do we solve this? Now, I think someone asked right earlier, I forgot who was it, but it's in the Zoom chat and I can't see. Uh, like, how do we do recursion for string? <clears throat> this is how you do recursion for string. Right? Again, we define the function, pp burger. All right, we all have our base case. And then we have our else statement. Something, and because like we want to sum things up, I think it's quite intuitive to just put a plus here and calls the burger price itself. There are some parts that we, we kind of need to figure out here. Now, remember when we deal with recursion, right? We go from big to small, big to small, big to small. So let's have several burgers an example, as an example. Say we have a burger patty burger, burger veggie patty burger, like bur bun, sorry, bun, cheese, cheese, cheese bun, maybe. Now, how do we make this smaller? Uh, as mentioned earlier, the way we can make this smaller is actually by cutting off the characters one by one. So in this case, we can char 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 uh, cut this into PB, and then cut it into B, cut it into VPB, cut it into PB, cut it into B, and cut to nothing. C, 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 B, C, C, B, C, B, B, nothing. Now after, so now we figure out that uh, when we actually cut things up, everything will end up at this particular point, an empty string. So we know uh, from this scenario, right, we kind of can infer that the base case should be an empty string. If burger is an empty string, All right? Now, what should I return? What is the price of an empty burger? What is the price of a nothing burger? And if it's not obvious enough, the, burger, the, and, and the price of an empty burger should be zero. Remember, we started the total with zero because in the beginning, right, when we don't have, we haven't scanned the price of each item in the burger, right, then zero, we haven't paid anything yet. Else, we take the, we'll take the burger, one ingredient. So to take it, we'll use string, string slicing, burger zero, right? As in this part over here, we'll take the whatever is left from the burger. Lah. Okay, but then if you just return this, right? Return this over here it does not give us the price of the burger, correct? It, it gives us the character, the letter of the burger. So instead, it means that this cannot be here. Hence, we kind of need some sort of intermediate, uh, intermediate uh, operation. 
in between the return and else. Basically, it's the same if else statement. Lah. We'll start like ingredient, which is uh, burger zero. And then we do an if else. Lah. If ingredient is equals to what, return what. Eh, no, um, price is um, five, else if price is 10, else price is 11. Then after we get the price of the ingredient, then we simply just include price here. Hence price plus the burger price of the leftover burger. And if you want to see the recursion in uh, action, basically we have uh, the price of burger price of B, P, P, B is equal to like the burger price of B plus B, P, 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 B, B plus V plus P, P. Sorry, my bad. B plus the burger price of an empty string which returns us nothing. That's it. So that's how you do recursion, uh, recursion for string. So when you're dealing with like characters where you need to iterate through the characters, what you kind of want to do is just like use the character, chop off part by part, bits by bits. And then like just like do calculation like this. Uh. Are there any questions? If not, then I want to give one final example that's not in this uh, tutorial. Um, let me send it to your telegram first. I hope I have that. Yes. T thirty three. Ah, this one. So I've seen a question in the Telegram group, which I think is a, it's a good question for us to practice as well. Mm, let me see if I can find the picture. I kind of forgot where I saved it. Uh, string slicing mutu. So, so like if I have A B C, uh, it will give me a B C. Okay, where did I save the damn picture? Okay, um, just have a look first in the Telegram group. Uh, for the uh, yeah, just have a look first. I'll try to pull out the question. Okay, how about uh, A B C minus one? So A B C minus one is actually, um, yeah. Again, like we have A A B C, and then its index, its negative index is minus one, minus two, minus three. Uh, so it stops. It starts from the beginning, and then stops at minus one. So it will stop right here. So uh, a b c uh, dot uh, colon minus one is returns a b. No, it's not something like the reverse of one. Okay, um, all right, let's try to do this question. So if you see the matchsticks, right, if you see the matchsticks, there are a few matchsticks, um, which is quite unclear. Lah. Damn it, where's the picture? Why 
why is compute this computer failing me at times like this? Always brings me sadness. Even paint works better. Okay. We'll deal with it. Okay, then we'll just work with this. So we have this uh, particular question. I hope you guys can see. Where um, basically we have a, like a matchstick pattern from hey hey please get an A plus thanks okay so we can <laughs> anyways we have this pattern one two three four so this is the input n and this is the output the output right we have like for n is one we have four n is two we have twelve n is three is twenty four n is four is forty now you need to come up with the recursive and iterative implementation. I'll just focus on recursive because in recursive, once you can get recursive, then you can do iterative. Now, uh, maybe this looks confusing, right? This is unlike other questions. It's just like unclear. It's just like they'll give you, um, they just give you a pattern, a string, an array of numbers, and you guys kind of need to figure out yourself. So. When you are when you are dealt with these kinds of questions, right? What you want to do is actually to figure out a pattern first. So I'll create a table, and basically the result. So when we'll start usually when it comes to numbers, right? We always want to include zero as well. When even if it's not. Included. So we know that when n is zero, there's zero chopsticks in uh, match sticks involved because there are no boxes. One is four. Two is twelve. Three is twenty-four, and four is forty. And then um, you can try to figure out the pattern any way you like, lah. Like maybe like this way, you guys can see the jump. This is four. This is eight. This is twelve. This is 16. And if you can see, actually, there's some interesting pattern over here that it's actually like uh, the increments, right, also increases by four every time. So we know for sure that uh, there is some pattern and we can somewhat, and how do we know that we can actually make a recursive function from it? Is that because we know that you kind of can actually form or create this number using this number over here. And you can create number 24 using number 12, but by adding a particular number that is somewhat consistent, constant and there's a pattern. Now, you can try to like spin your head like, and trying to figure out the pattern, but there's a reason why the question gives you pictures, right? If you actually realize, right, um, I mean, obviously, for obvious reasons, the match sticks in four, is uh, composed from matchsticks uh, from three, and the matchsticks, the boxes in three is composed from boxes from two. So if we, if I should draw, uh, this is the box for one, and this is the box for one, and then this is the box for two, and this is the bo uh, oops, this is the box for two, and then. This is the box for three, and this is the box for three. And we can see that for from what one, one to two, right? It's actually like two is equals to like the box of one plus one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight boxes. Eight eight sticks. And then for three, right, is F2 plus 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. And then for 3, F or N4 is like <coughs> F3 plus 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Am I, did I do my math correct? Yes, I do. And this one is like F0 plus 4. And this will be just like zero. If you can see, right, you kind of can see a recursion, recursive pattern over here, right, where four, 
F4 actually calls F3 plus 16, F3 calls F2 plus 12, and so on. So I think we can kind of uh, extract the pattern here, right? Is that Fn is equals to Fn minus 1 plus something. Now, what is that something? I think if you guys can figure, uh, if you guys can see the pattern, right? When n is 0, it is 0. When n is 1, it is 4. n is 2, it's 8. n is 3, it's 12. n is 4, it's 16. If you can see, right, there is like a um, times 4 multiplication here. Even for 0, right, times 4, we can like do a like, plus 0 times 4. So we know that, that if you times 4 is valid, hence as YJ has sent in the Zoom chat, what you want to do is like 4 times n. Hence we have our recursive formula when when uh, f is 0, when n is equal to 0, and f is equal to fn minus 1 plus 4 times n if n is else. Yeah, else. Okay, uh, Derek, did you raise your hand? I think I saw someone raise their hands. All right. So that's how you come up with a pattern, lah. Like um, another key take. So another key takeaway from this uh practice is that first you want to know like how usually because recursive right tries to call itself back. We want to figure out like how is uh f n is related to f n minus one or f n minus two. You kind of want to figure out like how is this related to this, how is this related to this, and so on. You want to figure that one out. If you cannot figure that one out, right, it's really hard to come up with the recursive function. You want to figure that one out and you want to figure out how it decrements. And finally, you want to figure out what's the base case. Okay, uh, Jeremy, you say you don't think you need n equals to zero. Um, in, my in my opinion, actually, you don't need the n equals to one. The reason is you want to make your code as general as possible that it can accept any values of n, except negative. So it's preferable for us to pick an n equals to zero instead of n equals to one. Yes, in order for us to identify how can we craft this to recursive, we need to look at the pattern. Yes, we do kind of need to look at the pattern. We just want, we want to see at the pattern like how uh, fn is made by all the previous fn's. It doesn't have to fn minus one. It can be fn minus two. It can be fn minus four. It, it's just like you want to see how is it formed from the previous one, and and that that there's some sort of dependency lah. Like you depend on other things. What if we can't find the pattern? Um, first of all, you can. Second of all, I don't think it would be that hard in an in a CS 10 10 e level exam to, you know, it's, it won't be that hard lah. I, I don't think it's gonna be that hard lah until you cannot find. If you want, you can drop me, business uh, engine students. Anyways, if optional training question appears in the midterms, I commit hari kari. Um, uh, I don't want to pop your bubble, eh, but that's actually very likely. It, it's quite likely that training questions show up. I mean, if you can see, right, this is not just some random question. Eh. This is like, this is CS 1010S mid, three midterm question. It's not just some random anyhow question. Oh, damn. Okay, so. With that, let's just start with another part of the, the talk. Let's just wrap this up. And let's go to the final part, um, which is part four, which is the hardest. Lah. Uh, so uh, I'll give you guys 10 minutes to actually do part four. 
And once you guys are done, just simply do it again in code share. Just share it in code share lah. I create a link. Wow, this question is from Katis, but they changed dots to sticks. Wow, not bad. You you do Katis. So okay, if you guys are, so let's try to attempt challenge four. So please uh, try to finish by um, say uh, one o ten. Okay, try to attempt it and learn. And yeah, for part 4a, it's basically uh, you kind of want to reuse the function sum. And for b, the Euler constant, it should be fun. La. That one is also like the recursive formula is quite well defined already. All right, happy coding, everyone. I mean, if you want your code to work, then you define lah. It's okay. It, like the earlier part is just like code share. Okay. Anyways, uh, I want to see the votes. Um, okay. Uh, I think a majority of you are understand. So let's just go with it. Everyone, go to your the Zoom chat part. And just like give me the answers. What's the answer for A? All right, well done. It's uh, zero zero. Full print X will go here, run this part because there's no X inside. It will try to find outside here. And this one will definitely print this one. All right, well done. Uh, what's B? A, okay, now what's the answer for B? Yes, it's another zero zero. So if you can see here, right over here, print x x is x is here. So this will be zero, and then it will go here. This one will be zero. Y is equal to zero. Hence, this will print this actu y actually because there's a y inside the function. Hence zero and this one will simply print this one well done part question c well done you guys are smart be proud so we'll run this part declares x as 999 print this one gives us 999 and then the function ends the minutes and basically everything is crossed out and then print x, we'll try to find the outside equals to zero. Good job, guys. So I think uh, what I want to show you, te bring, teach you guys is this one. And this one is actually pretty useful as well for next week's tutorial. Is It's called Python Tutor. So it can visualize your code. So I think I'll try to visualize of what's happened earlier. Like why is it 999, why is it zero? Uh, so this is the first question. If we press like we run x equals to zero, and then def foo, uh, we basically create this function. See, we create this function. So this variable foo print x will point to a function object, 
and then we run full print x. Now, if you can see right, full print x actually create a new frame down here that's outside the global frame. And then uh, I have a print x. Now what happens here is that because uh, what happens here is that because it does uh, inside the full print x there is no variable x right. It will try to look for an x in the global frame, which eventually prints zero. And then finally it returns a value none. And once it returns right, if you can see the frame actually disappears. And this is important in the idea of disappearing frame. Then finally print x it will print from the global frame. For the second question over here, I think very similar. We have the global frame declaring x is equal to zero, and then y equals to nine nine nine, and then creates a object full print x, and then we do full print x here, and here if you can see inside the frame there's a declared variable y equals to zero, and because there is a y inside the frame of the function. The print y over here will actually print this one over here instead. Return value, the frame disappears, print x, 999. All right. Now, the disappearing frame is actually very important in the very final question over here. If you can see, we start from the beginning, we declare the function, we call the function, x is 999, we print that x, right, and then return value. And next, the frame disappears. That's why this x over here, right, never prints x equals to 999 because technically that 999 only belongs inside the function and it disappears already. Hence, it will print zero, the x that is known in the global frame. I hope there uh, you guys learn a lot. I think so in general principle, when we talk about like variable scoping, when we try to pick which variable should we pick, right? You should, in like, there are three principles. Uh, uh, the first one is try, try to look up. You should try to find a variable that's above you. If that variable doesn't exist, then look up. Meaning that you should look outside your uh, function, whether it has been defined or not. So for example, this one, it, it actually looks in the global frame over here. But most importantly, right, what you should never do is look inside. This one is a big no. So in this case, this x over here, right, never looked inside in this x. Never. Never look inside. Okay? So I have that, that clears things up for variable scoping. Now I have two more minutes. Uh, I'm just going to take five more minutes to explain something called a uh, short circuit logic. So I think for those of you who uh, don't understand the principle, uh, what short circuit logic means, I mean like, just imagine it as the secret it's the same circuit as the circuit breaker that they use to yeah, describe the lockdown period. It's the same circuit breaker in your house. Lah. So basically, it can break your logic in a good way. So we have this uh, particular function over here. We have f1 that returns true. And we have foo that, re that have a statement over here. And then we call it if a is greater than 1 or f1 meaning that if this one we valid as true or true, hence this entire statement is true, right? Hence this conditional is satisfied, then it will return yes. So as expected, the output is yes. Now we modify our functions a bit. We modify f1 a bit by actually adding this. Print ha ha ha. Again, when we run this right over here, this one is, we valid this true and we valid this f1 as true. Now, since we actually call this function, right, to return true, we also should have printed ha 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 as well. When we evaluate this part, right? And then it's true, and then it returns yes. But in fact, the output is actually only yes, and there's no ha ha ha. Confused, right? 
like is this supposed to be isn't it supposed to be ha ha yes and if you actually notice what happened is that the function f1 was, was skipped why uh because it is something that is called short circuit logic so what happens is that if the left side of or like the left side of the or can decide the output already then the right side will be skipped so in this case we know that this is true right this is true and in an all conditional statement right as with at least one of the statement is true right the entire statement will be true true or question mark it will be valid as true that's because we know for certain that this will be true regardless regardless of whatever the value of f1 is right hence python will never evaluate this part over here and hence this function has will never run so in this case similar with and in in the scenario of and if one value is false and any value then we can evaluate that the entire statement is false in this case a is 0 a is not greater than 1 then this is false Hence, this part is never run. So, in conclusion, if the left side, if the left side of the logical operator, yeah, whatever, can decide the output, the right, the right side will be skipped. And this is good, but sometimes it's quite problematic because it can dodge errors as well. For example, we have this undeclared function over here rubbish so if it, there's an undeclared function the, it should actually throw an error right like it should throw an error but because it is actually stopped here right so it it does it this part is skipped okay so priority to from left to right uh, okay wait wait let me answer some question uh yeah so if you put f1 or a0, it will return true. Yes. Eh? Yeah lah, yeah lah. Because f1 is, yeah lah, because f1 is true. Or a greater than, this is true. So it evaluated as true, regardless of this part. Um, priority from left to right, yes. It's not exactly, yeah, it is priority lah. I mean like, remember when we're doing math, right? We do it from left to right lah. So what we process it from left to right, but one by one. So the ordering of your function, right, is actually pretty important. And this is, this can be quite problematic as you might be writing your exam and you actually might miss it, miss some edge cases because you're in the public test case, right? Um, it won't break your code over here, but in the private test case, it actually breaks it. Excuse me, it doesn't work that way for grades. Wait, even if it's an and. Yeah, so like if it's and, so like if it's false and true, right, this part will not be evaluated. It will just like immediately evaluate as false. So let's say left side is false in the statement where a and blah, blah, blah. blah. So since a is false, it will straight away return false, correct without even evaluating this part. This more part won't be evaluated. Okay. Uh, okay, my, my lungs are dying. So, uh, yeah, um, basically that's the end of the tutorials material this week. Um, I do hope that you guys now have a better grasp and better understanding of what recursive, recursion is, that it is actually an attempt or an approach to solving problems instead of like actual code. And you guys can actually attempt it on your own. Um, yeah, lah, so you... Um, and I hope that now you guys can actually write your own code lah in recursion because I think it's pretty important if you can write your own recursion code because it's going to show up a lot in exams. Um, if you guys have any, I think you guys can actually do assignment three already. 
if you guys got any problems, feel free to text me, ask me anything. Um, good luck for next tomorrow's mock PE. If there are any problems with the recorder, just refer to the forum. I'll try to help as much as possible, but uh, I'll just let you know like, I'll be busy today until like midnight because I got I got class till 9.30 p.m. and I got a submission due tonight, so I gotta chase everything up. Uh, okay, I'll just stop the recording here. If there are any questions, I'll take questions until like 1.50. All right.